So hi everyone, I'm Dr. Deepthi and we would be uh, looking at the OBS and GYNE questions in the November INI CT session. Right, so we do have uh, quite a large number of questions in OBS and GYNE and this covers questions from both the morning as well as the evening session. Yes, so let's look at the first question. So I've also side by side put these snapshots of uh, where we have uh, taken the same and exactly the same thing from the class or the TND paper itself, right? So let's look at the first question. All are long acting reversible contraceptives except, yes? So long acting reversible contraceptive. Yes, and we have done this, that the answer to this question would be tubal ligation. So remember, tubal ligation is a permanent method of contraception and not considered as a reversible method. In fact, we did the same question in the TND paper as well. Okay. Also, just remember that for tubal ligation, yes, when we talk about the consent, consent of only the woman is mandatory. Right. So please remember the consent of spouse is not mandatory, <coughs> right? Okay, so let's look at the next question. So this was a girl presents with amenorrhea. Which of the following is defined as primary amenorrhea? So if you remember, we have done this, right? We would say that it is primary amenorrhea and the cutoff is going to be 13 years when the secondary sexual characters are absent, Yes, whereas if secondary sexual characters are present, then you have to wait up till the age of 15 years to make the diagnosis. So when we consider these facts, so only and only option A would be the answer. She has crossed the uh, landmark of 13 years and the breast is still Tanner stage 1. So if you remember, we've taught you in the class that whenever we talk about appearance of secondary sexual characters, we have to look at the breast as Tanner 2. So anything at and beyond Tanner 2 means that secondary sexual characters have appeared. Yes, so when it says Tanner stage 1 breast, it means the lark has not happened. So that's what we said. In the absence of secondary sexual characters, we will consider the age group or landmark as 13 years. So 14 years is the correct answer here. Whereas if you look at option B, she is 13 year old and Tanner stage is 5. So when Thelark has happened, you have to wait up till 15 years of age. Similarly, when you talk about 12 year old with Tanner stage 4, it again means you have to wait up till 15 years of age. And when we say 11 year old with Tanner 1, so in the absence of secondary sexual characters, you have to wait until 13 years of age. So only option A is the correct answer. Yes. Let's look at the next one. So diethyl still best at all. Yes, it is a teratogenic drug and which cancer is associated with it. So if you remember, whenever we talk about diethyl still best at all and uh, we say that in the female genital tract, I told you there are two very important things which are often asked and you should know that with respect to the female fetus, the classic finding in the uterus will be a T-shaped uterus and it specially is known to cause clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Yes, so clear cell cancer or clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina is what is associated with diethyl still best role use in pregnancy, right? Okay, let's look at the next question. So next question was minimum number of antenatal visits, but they have given as per WHO. So again, you should know this, that as per the government of India, the minimum requirement is four visits. Yes, but these are Indian guidelines. And we have taught you that as per WHO, the minimum requirement has to be eight visits. Yes, so the first visit has to be within the first 12 weeks. Uh, the next week, one at around 20, then 26 weeks, then 30 weeks, then 34 weeks, 36, 38 and 40 weeks. So a minimum of eight contact visits as per WHO guidelines. Whereas again, I'm repeating as per the Indian guidelines, the requirement has to be four of minimum visits. Yes. Okay. So here the answer is eight. Then we had to arrange these steps uh, in sequence 
as they are done in dilatation and curettage. Yes. So I have already put these steps in order so that we know the correct answer. So the the first step is assess the uterus direction and size. So you know uh, you have to do a PD examination to know the size of the uterus and to know whether it is antiverted and antiflexed or not. Yes. Then once you clean, drape, you put the same speculum. Often we'll use the uterine sound, which also acts as the first dilator. Then it also confirms the direction of the uterus. Then you will do serial dilatation with Hagar's dilators. And then we would do the curettage. Yes. So the correct order is one, two, three and four. Right. So they were jumbled up. But what I've done is I've already put them in correct order for you to know what is the sequence so that it becomes easier to revise when you're going through the videos. Yes. All right. So which of these is not a method of abortion in the first trimester? So please, please remember, we have done this very clearly that when we talk about extra amniotic ethacridine, it is a method of second trimester abortion. Yes. So, uh, you know, we have done that in second trimester abortions. Uh, in the medical methods, most commonly we use prostaglandins. But the other drugs that are approved by the government of India are extra amniotic ethacridine, intra amniotic hyperosmolar saline and then the last one in the list is oxytocin. So extra amniotic ethacridine is what is not used in the first trimester. Now some students are confused with the option of dilatation and curettage. So please remember, you're always going to dilate even when you're going to put a suction, uh, you know, cannula inside. And at the end of the suction, you also do a check curettage, right? So DNC is a simple surgical method and it can be used to complete first trimester abortions as well. Okay, so the best answer here would be extra amniotic ethacridine. It is a direct question and it is a method of second trimester MTP. Okay, then. First sign of magnesium toxicity. So it is loss of knee jerk or patellar reflex. So this is again a snapshot from the class notes that we have done. So yes, the first sign uh, as you can see of magnesium toxicity is loss of patellar reflex, which happens at 7 to 10 milli equivalents. Yes, at 12 milli equivalents, there is going to be a respiratory arrest. At 15, there are cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac conduction defects. And you know, at 20 to 25, there can be a cardiac arrest itself. Okay. So please remember, uh, the antidote is 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate. And also remember that oliguria is not a sign of magnesium toxicity. Oliguria actually can cause magnesium toxicity, but it is not a sign of magnesium toxicity. Also remember, MagSelf by itself does not cause low blood pressure. It is not a antihypertensive drug. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so next is all are true about late deceleration except. So I've tried to collect whatever best options I could uh, from my resources. So, uh, you know, as we know that late deceleration will start at the middle of the uh, or the peak of the contraction. So it says start with or after the contraction, but always ends after the contraction. Yes, that is why it is called as the late deceleration. And yes, it is symmetrical and wide. So as we have done it in the class, it is going to be, uh, you know, a gradual onset, a gradual dip and a gradual pickup. It is smooth and wide. Yes, it persists after the contraction. Usually along with it, there will be a reduction in the beat to beat variability. Yes. And uh, from the onset to the maximum dip, it will take more than 30 seconds. That's why we said it is a gradual fall and a gradual pickup. Right. So from the onset of the dip to the minimum value of the heart rate, it will take more than 30 seconds. So it's wide. Yes. And uh, uh, yes, just like acceleration, there should be a fall of at least uh, 15 beats per minute below the baseline. So there has to be a more than 10 to 20 minute uh, fall from the baseline. So the best answer here is actually D, variable and short. They are not variable and short. So as I mentioned, they are actually wide. Yes, so gradual fall, a gradual pickup, so wide. 
and we all know that the cause of late decelerations is uteroplacental insufficiency yes yeah? so the best answer here is variable and short okay which part of the hpv virus is used to make the vaccine so in fact in this question they had given the uh, the virus and various proteins uh, in i think in an image format yes and you had to pick up which one is used to make the vaccine so we have again done this it is the l1 capsid protein of the virus which is used to make the vaccine yes so the answer is l1 whereas e6 and e7 yes are viral proteins which are required for malignant transformation okay so they are required for malignant transformation yes so here the best answer is l1 capsid protein okay then let's look at the next question so vulval cancer most common age group so uh, advancing age is what is the risk factor or uh, the age group for vulval cancer so the best answer here is 65 to 85 i think some of the recall said one option was both the above and one option was none of the above and then some recall said that uh, age below 18 or age below 20 was one of the options but any which ways so you have to know the uh, the age group is actually uh, so most common agar puche it is between 65 to 75 years of age so as the age increases the incidence of vulvar cancer increases so that's the best answer uh, since it has been asking about most common age group yes okay there is another question on vulvar cancer which said all are risk factors so they were in separate sessions one in the morning session and one in the evening session so uh, smoking is a risk factor yes vulval dystrophy as well as uh, you know um, human papilloma virus yes so uh, we often say that all risk factors for cervical cancer are actually also risk factors for vulvar cancer so vulvar intra epithelial neoplasia okay similarly history of cervical cancer then as i mentioned cigarette smoking is a risk factor lichen sclerosis and vulval dystrophies are also risk factors okay very importantly remember immunodeficiency syndrome are also risk factors so immunodeficiency syndromes are also risk factors and then um, apart from this so the answer here is actually vulvar hematoma uh, it is not a risk factor for vulvar cancer please remember that the most common cancer here is squamous cell cancer the most common hpv subtype associated is H again hpv 16 and the second in the list is hpv 33 so those are the two hpv strains which are having a high association with vulvar cancer yes okay let's move further now now this was an easy question although the image quality was very poor so this was just an image of an nst graph and they have asked you what modality is this or what is this yes and the typical recall that i got was that in this graph there were no uterine contractions shown so it was just a graph with the fetal heart rate yes and then this is something that we have told you that when you talk about the ctg machine the cardio tocography machine the same machine when you use both probes yes so when you use a probe to pick up the fetal heart rate and when you use the probe to pick up the uterine contractions so which means during labor you you call it as a ctg cardio tocography but when the woman is not in labor you are using only one probe which is actually picking up the fetal heart rate and then it's simply called as the non stress test right so simply you're using only one of the probes so that's what they had actually asked so uh, as the student said that the image quality was really poor for this one but they could clearly recall that uterine contractions were not shown so if uterine contractions are not shown it's not a ctg tracing it is rather a non stress test yes and um, from the recall as i can say uh, students could really not comment upon beat to beat variability or baseline heart rate because they said it was a blurred image but it was a simple question asking you what is this and the graph paper was shown yes okay so again uh, 
a very predicted question and we have talked about it multiple times. So, not a component of biophysical profile. Yes, so when you say not a component, the answer is DFMC. So, DFMC is daily fetal movement count, also called as DFMR. Yes, so daily fetal movement count is not a component of uh, biophysical profile. So, the components or five components of biophysical profile are fetal breathing movements, gross body movements, fetal tone, amniotic fluid volume and non-stress test. Yes, now please remember some students get confused and you start overthinking in the exams that ma'am amniotic fluid index hona chahiye tha. So, no, bache, so DFMC is not a part of biophysical profile, yes. And when we talk about amniotic fluid, we talk about that even if you see a single pocket of 2 centimeters, then, uh, you know, you give a score of plus 2. So, if you remember that parameter, you will understand that it is not uh, amniotic fluid index, yes, because in index, 2 centimeters is not normal, it is oligohydramnios. So, please don't overthink in the exam beta G because then, you know, you tend to do even easy questions wrong. So, this is DFMC, okay. Now, this is a question where I don't have uh, the complete uh, recall on two sides because it was a match the following kind of a question. But what I can clearly get as a recall is that, uh, you know, you were given two columns and you had to select which column is correctly matched. Yes, and it was a multiple correct option. So, uh, the two options that were probably correctly matched were amniocentesis, so which uh, is done between 15 to 20 weeks. And yes, uh, you can do it to know the alpha fetoprotein levels as well, which could be a marker of neural tube defects. Okay. And fetoscopy. So, fetoscopy is done uh, for visualization of the fetus. And fetoscopy can be done anywhere in the second and the third trimester. Uh, fetoscopy can be done to take a biopsy or it can be done to, uh, you know, for uh, laser agglutination of the vessels. Yes. And for example, as you know, we do it even in twin twin transfusion syndrome. Okay. So that is visualization of the fetus. Chorionic villus sampling, again, we've repeatedly told you that it is not to be done at less than or equal to 9 weeks. It has to be done at and beyond 10 weeks. And most commonly, it is done between 11 to 13 weeks. Fetal blood sampling, uh, I could not get what they had given on the other side. But yes, that is what is chordosynthesis. And it can be done anywhere beyond 18 weeks. Usually, done uh, to know the hemoglobin status of the baby, for example, in RH incompatibility. Yes, so that is the use of uh, chordosynthesis. Yes, and CVS, you all know, is mainly done for karyotyping uh, as a follow-up test uh, for Down syndrome when these screening tests are positive. Yes, so that is why uh, through the match the following that I have made, the ones that are correctly matched are amniocentesis and fetoscopy, okay? Right, so the next question was, your patient is less than 34 weeks and she has mild to moderate anemia. Uh, how would you treat her according to the Anemia Mukt Bharat Abhiyan? Yes, so this is again, I am just uh, taking out the snapshot where we have done it. So, mild to moderate Anemia may, uh, we've taught you that the treatment depends on the POG. So, if the POG is beyond 34 weeks, then you have to straight away give her parenteral iron. Whereas, if it is less than 34 weeks, you have to give her oral iron and this will be twice a day. Not just that, we've told you that you have to repeat hemoglobin at one month. Yes. And if the hemoglobin is rising by more than one gram person, then you continue oral iron. But if the rise is less, then you have to think about, uh, is she non-compliant or is it not getting absorbed? And then you might have to switch her over to parenteral. So parenteral is only given when either the woman is not tolerating or when the oral iron is not being absorbed because of some malabsorptive syndromes. Yes. And also I've taught you that never give the two together. 
So when you are switching over the patient to parenteral therapy, oral iron has to be stopped. Yes. So based on this, the answer will be IV sucrose only when she is resistant to oral iron. Yes, ferric carboxymaltose uh, can also be given, but what we prefer based on the anemia mukt Bharat Abhiyan is IV sucrose. Okay, as I said, you will never give them together, right? So oral iron and IV sucrose are not to be given together. It can cause toxicity, and uh, oral iron and FA TDS. No, so we don't give it twice a day. I told you we are going to give it, give the tabs. Twice a day, not three times a day. So that is why option A is also incorrect. Yes. Okay. So all are additional or non-contraceptive benefits of uh, oral contraceptive pill. So this is again directly from the contraceptive video that we have done. So definitely. Uh, oral contraceptive pills will reduce the risk of endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, and they also reduce the absolute number of ectopic pregnancies. But they do not re reduce the transmission of HIV virus or sexually transmitted infections. In fact, there are studies which say that uh, the transmission of chlamydia may increase with OCPs. Yes. Also remember the uh, important other non-contraceptive benefits that you should know are, uh, you know, so menstrual cycle disorders. So this can be irregular cycles where you can use OCPs. This can be dysmenorrhea during the cycles where again you can use OCPs. Then it could be women who have abnormal uterine bleeding where again we can use OCPs. Women with PCOS who actually have Irregular cycles, they may also have heavy bleeding. You know that OCP is the drug of choice. Then women with premenstrual syndrome. Okay. Then pelvic pain disorders. So apart from dysmenorrhea, OCPs are useful for chronic pelvic pain. You also know they are useful in women with endometriosis. Okay. Then they help in the reduction of ovarian cyst. They also help in the reduction of benign breast disease. You also know that OCPs are the drug of choice for hyperandrogenism. For example, hirsutism. Yes, so they are again going to be the drug of choice. Uh, cancers, I've already told you, it reduces risk of ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer. And in some reports, they say it also reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. Right? Okay. Let's move on to the next question. So next question was that your patient is 35 plus 5 weeks. She has a very high blood pressure of 170 by 110. She has blurring of vision and she has headache. So we are dealing with a case of IE, impending eclampsia. And they had asked you the next line of management. So if you remember this, this is how we have done it in the class as well. So when a patient of impending eclampsia comes, uh, the first goal is to prevent seizure. So when we have to pick one answer, it is going to be mag self. At the same time, it is important to control the blood pressure. And once you have given the prophylactic mag self and you have controlled the blood pressure, you must consider termination of pregnancy after patient stabilization. So all three are components of management with single best answer being uh, mag self when they ask you next step and you have to mark only one. Luckily, here you didn't have to choose between the three. So the answer was treat hypertension, give Maxalf and terminate the pregnancy. So once it is impending eclampsia, you have to do this irrespective of period of gestation. So you will not wait till 37 weeks. You do not have time to give a steroid cover to your patient. And because the management is termination, there is no role of tocolytics as well. Okay. All right. So again, this was a question which says non-immune non hydrops is seen in all except. So let's look at this. So we have done that hydrops fetalis. Nowadays, the most common cause of hydrops fetalis is non-immune hydrops fetalis and not immune hydrops. Okay, now when we talk about non-immune here also, the most common cause of non-immune is cardiovascular causes in the fetus. 
there could be anatomical problems there could be conduction problems okay so it is cardiovascular system the second leading cause is anemia for example fetal thalassemia then infections so parvovirus and all torch group of infections can cause non immune hydrops fetalis right so that's what we've done in the class as well so here you had to pick all our causes except so the answer is hiv so hiv yes does not cause or is not one of the causes of non immune hydrops fetalis okay and i think uh, from the recall what i got some of some people said that the option also had parvovirus so whatever it is parvovirus torch group they all do cause non immune hydrops okay chalo aage badhte hain so this was a question where you had to arrange the sequence of steps in management of third stage of labor so i have already put them in the sequence uh so that the purpose is when you want to go back and you want to revise quickly you you know what is to be done yes so first you have to check that there is no second baby in uterus okay so if it's a twin pregnancy you should not be doing things before the second baby is out so first check for the second baby then give 10 units of oxytocin okay it can be given im or it can be given as iv but when you give it iv it has to be infusion and not iv bolus right then you have to remove the placenta so placenta because we do active management of third stage of labor so you are going to do a controlled cord traction which is the modified brand and ruse method and please remember as per the guidelines we have to do a delayed cord clamping yes so at and beyond 1 minute and lastly you should be doing a intermittent uterine tone assessment so massage is not to be done routinely but since it was one of the components it comes last so check for the second baby give oxytocin do a control cord traction delayed cord clamping is to be done and then do uterine massage and as per the who guidelines it should actually be a intermittent uterine tone assessment okay so this is actually the correct order of steps 1 2 3 4 okay then the next question is which protein hormone is secreted by the placenta right so remember this so whenever we talk about hcg that is how we start that hcg is a glycoprotein hormone right so this is again a snapshot from our lecture itself so it's a glycoprotein hormone which has two subunits where you all know that alpha subunit is uh, the non specific subunit so it is absolutely identical to alpha of lh fsh and tsh yes and the beta is the one which is specific but i hope you remember that the beta subunit is very similar it's not identical but similar to beta of lh so you know there's another question so here the answer is definitely hcg but there was another question where we ask you hcg is uh, you know uh, structurally and functionally similar to which hormone then the single best answer would be luteinizing hormone right chalo aage badhte hain so this was a question where it was an ibq and they had given you this exact image and it was easy to identify you see hair inside the ovarian tumor and whenever you do that so this was the classical picture that we have also shown you in routine classes as well as in the tnd so this is the tnd uh, question paper uh, itself of this year so when you see this you know that it is a mature cystic teratoma so it's a dermoid and the other name for dermoid is a mature cystic teratoma okay so uh, that's why we keep hammering on certain things that they have high probability of being asked so that you don't do common things wrong yes and uh, as you know as you can see here please remember these important points about it that they are bilateral in 80% cases uh, they have a low risk of uh, you know uh, so when okay so bilateral in 80% is actually incorrect that's the false statement in fact they are bilateral in only up to 10% cases so mostly they are 
unilateral. So this question was which is wrong. So that is why A was the answer there. Yes, the risk of malignancy is very small, 0.2 to 2%. And it has derivatives of all three germ layers. And it has the highest risk of torsion. Yes. So remember these other points about the dermoid. Yes. Okay. Let's move for, for, uh, further now. So the exact image was also asked in your current exams. Uh, I think you had to identify what it is or probably tell when it is done. So this is a picture from the classes. So this is a image of amniocentesis, right? So it's an image of amniocentesis. As I said, it is done at and beyond 15 weeks. Most commonly, we will do it around 16 to 18 weeks. And uh, please remember, you should know the uh, indications why would you do amniocentesis, yes? So majority of times, we're doing amniocentesis as a diagnostic procedure, okay? So it can be done to do a genetic analysis. It can be done to know about the LS ratio. It can be done to know about hemolytic disease, okay, or hemolysis. It can be done to make a diagnosis of viral infections because we will do a amniotic fluid PCR analysis. Then neural tube defects where I told you you could look for acetylcholinesterase or alpha fetoprotein, yes. So those are some of the most important indications of why we would do a diagnostic amniocentesis, right? Okay, so vagitus uterinus is nothing but the cry of unborn baby. Yes, so it is not an infection of vagina or infection of the uterus. It is a cry of unborn baby. Okay, so then uh, they had given you a classical clinical description and you had to pick up what is the diagnosis. So as taught in class, whenever you see these keywords, for example, short stature, webbed neck, shield-shaped chest, cubitus valgus, short fourth metacarpal, low posterior hairline. These are classical features of Turner syndrome. I'm sure it was an easy question for all of you. Remember what we have taught you in classes that the IQ is normal. The most common cardiovascular finding is a bicuspid aortic valve. Right, and the lifespan is slightly reduced because of cardiovascular abnormalities. Okay, so the answer is Turner's. Okay, so this was again a direct image in your question, and it is an image from this year's TND paper itself. So, this was the image, and you had to tell the diagnosis. So, this is nothing but vulval lichen sclerosis, right? So, where you see thin. Uh, uh, you know, atrophic vagina, um, absolutely parched, and then it can give way, there can be fissures, there can be bleeding, it usually presents as pruritus, right? So this was, uh, there was no clinical history given. In the TND paper, we had also given you the clinical history on how this patient can present. So, but yes, this was the typical image of the paper itself, right? Direct from the TND paper. So this is vulvar lichen sclerosis, okay? Let's move forward. So, which is wrong about normal placenta, uh, right? So, um, you know, um, there was an option which says it has two blood vessels, which is wrong because the umbilical cord will have three vessels normally. It's a three-vessel cord. There are two arteries and one vein. So, remember these things that we have done because these are repeatedly asked questions. So when we talk about normal placenta, the diameter is around 20 centimeters. The weight is around 500 grams. The average thickness is 2.5, but it can go up to 4 centimeters. Uh, we also told you that the fetus to placenta weight at term, it's about 6 is to 1 and they weigh the same at around 17 weeks. Okay, so those were the pointers. And yes, as I mentioned, it is supposed to be a three vessel cord. So two arteries and one vein. It is the left umbilical vein. The right one actually disappears. Okay. Yes, so this was uh, again one of the images of your exam question, although not the exact image, but what recall I got was it is very similar to the one that I showed in the class. So this is the one that I've shown in the class. So it was actually a combination. There was a succinct lobe, which was widely separated. 
and there was also membranous attachment of the cord. So the answer was actually both a membranous cord and a succinctuate lobe. Yes. Okay. And it was again only an IBQ with no history, nothing given with it. Okay. So let's look at the next question. It says, uh, you had to identify the false statement about uh, certain pregnancy things that were given. So the answer here is B. The period of gestation is calculated from the last day of LMP, which is incorrect. So please remember the basics that we teach you. That is why in classes we go from right from basics and then go to the application. Yes. So when we talk about LMP, it has to be calculated from the first day. Yes, so whenever you calculate LMP or, or whenever you calculate period of gestation or you calculate EDD, you have to calculate from the first day of the last menstrual period, not the last day. Yes, the other statements are actually correct. So each trimester is approximately 14 weeks because yes, that is the uh, universal definition. So 14, 28 and then it goes up to 42. In India, our national guidelines say up till 12 weeks, it is the first trimester. But if you look at it internationally, it is first 13 plus 6 is taken as the first trimester. So option A is actually correct, not incorrect. And uh, yes, the accurate gestational age is done from the first trimester ultrasound. So repeatedly hammered. I also gave it in the concise CRIS provision series that I have done. Yes, that you would be using CRL for this. And the ideal time is between 7 to 10 weeks for gestational age assessment. Although CRL can be used right up till the end of the first trimester as the best parameter for gestational age assessment. Okay, sorry. So the answer written here is wrong. The answer is actually B. That period of gestation is calculated from the last day because you have to pick up the false statement. So that's the answer here. Okay. Okay, let's look at the next one. So this was the question where we, again, they asked you to arrange in the correct order. So what I've done is I have already put it in the correct order. So the first thing will be engagement. Then it is crowning. Okay, that is when you start seeing the head at the introitus or the vaginal opening and it doesn't recede back in between the contractions. Then the head is delivered by extension, which will be followed by restitution external rotation. Now, restitution is not a separate movement. It's very much a part of external rotation. So, students got confused. But if you remember, we have done this exactly in the same way in the class. So, we've given you the cardinal movements of labor in the correct order. And then we taught you about restitution and about external rotation. We told you that restitution is happening first. Yes, that is unbinding of the head. So the first one eighth movement is what is called as restitution. And then there will be external rotation. Yes, so that is the correct sequence of events. Okay, so this was a question which was, I think, a multiple correct uh, question where you were asked to compare between placenta previa and abruption clinical features. And if you remember, this is exactly how we do it in the class, right? So we did it in a comparative format. So remember, painless, causeless, bright red, whereas painful, altered in color, usually having a preceded event. Uh, fundal height more than POG, they are all features of abruption, whereas warning hemorrhages are features of placenta previa. So uh, maybe it is not the exact recall because I tried a lot, but students were not able to frame the exact options. So that is why I'm just simply giving you what the options were and if it is multiple correct. So features of abruption, multiple correct. So uterine tenderness is correct. Painful bleeding is correct and a fundal height more than POG is correct. Warning hemorrhages is for placenta previa. I'm sure this was an easy question and you have done it right. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So the signs, so this question was that a lady comes to you by eight weeks and on clinical examination, what all signs will you be seeing in her? So the question said that, uh, there were four options and you had to select two. So it was again a multiple correct. So each option was framed as one and two, two and three, two and four and so on. 
Yes. So the correct ones at eight weeks are Goodles and Oziander sign. So if you remember this, we said that the softening signs, which are the Hagar's and Goodles, are seen by six weeks. Usually, all the other named signs are seen by eight weeks. When you talk about internal velocity, this is seen at around 16 weeks, whereas lightning is what is seen at the end of third trimester. So when a lady is coming at eight weeks of POG, what you will be seeing are the Goodles and the Oziander sign. Okay, which hormone do not influence fetal growth? So here the answer is going to be steroids. Steroids are actually for fetal lung maturation, not exactly for fetal growth. Whereas the other mentioned hormones, whether it is uh, TSH or insulin-like growth factors or growth hormones would take part in fetal growth. Okay. Then this was a direct question. Name the sign in which you see uh, gas in big vessels and heart. So if you remember, this is a snapshot from the class. So IUD fetus, we did the named sign. So yes, it is the Robert sign where you see ga gas in the large vessels. Spaldings is overlapping of the parietal bones. And ball sign is where you see the hyperflexion of spine. Yes, so they're all signs of intrauterine death. Okay, so this was a question where uh, there were two columns and you had to do the correct matching. So I have already done the correct matching and put it here so that you can quickly go through the answers. So thalidomide causes spocomelia, isotretinoin microtia or anotia, uh, chloramphenicol gray baby syndrome and warfarin depressed nasal bridge. Yes, and if you remember, uh, when we were doing this topic of teratogenesis, there were certain drugs that I said are must-knows, and four, three out of the, these four mentioned are a part of that short list that I gave you with only five, six drugs, which I said are must-knows, right? So this is the correct matching of the drugs and the teratogenic profile, okay? All the following are risk factors for uterine dysfunction except. So the best answer here is multiparity. Usually uterine dysfunction is seen in nulli paras or in primi gravidas. High station, yes, uh, will cause uterine dysfunction. Infection will cause uterine dysfunction. Uh, you know, excessive use of sedation uh, or very early use of epidural analgesia can also cause uterine dysfunction. So multiparity is the best answer among these three, among these four actually. Okay, then perimortem cesarean section is done at. So the answer is upper segment. So if you remember, we have done this also in class where we said, what are the modern day indications of a classical cesarean, which is a vertical scar in the upper segment of the uterus, right? And uh, I hope you, uh, simply because it gives you a faster access. So this is basically when the lady is having a cardiac arrest. So the guidelines say that we should try and deliver the baby within five minutes. So you have to gain uh, quick access to the abdomen and try and deliver out the baby. So we would usually go for an upper segment cesarean. Also, please remember because this is a perimortem CS, it doesn't have to be done in the OT. It has to be done in uh, the emergency department itself. Okay, so it has to be done at the site where you are doing the resuscitation. And throughout the time when you are delivering the baby, the resuscitation has to continue. And as I said, the guidelines are that the baby should be delivered within five minutes. Okay. So this uh, could be taken as a question from psychiatry, pharmacology or, uh, you know, uh, obstetrics since it mentions pregnancy. And uh, I'm sure uh, that my uh, psychiatry and pharmacology colleagues would agree. And in case there is any discrepancy, we'll give you the answer. But yes, from what I know, um, SSRI exposure uh, to the fetus in pregnancy has been associated with low APGAR scores persistent pulmonary hypertension, and delayed motor development. So this, they say there is a significant, although small, okay? So small but significant uh, association with delay in fine motor development. 
so that's what we uh, research says okay <clears throat> there was a question about uh, ovarian cancer recurrence so uh, again um, maybe the options are not all correctly framed but i try to get whatever the best possible recall is so if it occurs in less than 6 months then you call it as a platinum resistance case then this is what is the true statement uh if it be, if it recurs beyond 6 months it is simply called as platinum sensitive case right so we there is no uh, terminology like partially resistant or uh more than 12 months as relapse there are only two terminologies so we call it as a platinum sensitive or we call it as platinum resistant so if it happens within 6 months of chemotherapy if there is a relapse you call it as a resistant case if it happens beyond 6 months you consider it as a sensitive case so those were uh, the questions uh, there may be one uh, more question but i would typically say those are core pharmacology questions so i deliberately left them out but still a significant number of questions around 18 to 20 questions in every session so obsin gyne remains as a very important topic uh a uh, subject for inict as well as for neat pg uh hope you are happy with how you have performed in obsin gyne do let me know uh what all topics do you want to now revise uh from if after inict to neat pg i will continue with the revision series i wish you all the very best for your results as well as for the upcoming exams do reach out to me on instagram as well and let me know uh if you need any assistance and what would you want to revise take care all the best everyone